maybe, yeah, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here with us. I'm really uh, excited to uh, present the Spark on Kubernetes talk today. Uh, my name is uh, Melody Young. I'm a senior big data architect in AWS. With me is my co-presenter, uh, Zhou Keyong. So he is the big data engineer from the Ali Cloud, and also he is the creator of Apache Calibon. Sorry, yeah, thank you. So, um, sorry I have to present in English uh, because I don't want to make a mistake when I'm presenting in English call the shuffle service as a xi pai, <laughs> xi pai fu. Uh, so we are not really presenting about the gambling uh, industry use case. Uh, actually, shuffle service means a spark data shuffling, right? So I'm going to present in English and um, uh, Ke Yong, he is going to present in Chinese to deep dive about the uh, Apache Calibon service. Don't worry if you don't understand. Uh, we have a lot of pictures, architecture diagrams for you to understand. It's all written in English. Yeah, so if you have any questions in English, uh, that's totally fine, I can translate. Okay, thank you for joining us. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so in the era of uh, data driving everything, Apache Spark has uh, emerged as a very popular big data framework, right? It can handle large scale data processing needs. Um, uh, the common use cases are machine learning, such as the hot topic we are talking about today, Gen AI or ETL processes, right? Some data scientists said 80% of their workload is about ETL, data engineering. So, what is the challenge when we are talking about Spark on Kubernetes? One of the where known uh, issue, uh, challenges is uh, how to support the dynamic resource allocation, DRA for short, right? So, this is our talk today, we will cover uh, what is the key challenges in Spark on Kubernetes, especially around the shuffle, uh, data shuffle and DRA. Uh, I will also share with you the first hand of benchmarking result when I tested the solution with Apache, uh, Apache Calibon. Uh, after that, I will hand over to Ke Yong to deep dive into the Spark shuffle and DRA Calibon uh, project. Then he, he will also cover what is the next in the roadmap. So I want to uh, just ask the room, how many of you are familiar with Spark on Kubernetes? Great, <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, so actually less than half of the audience in the room. Um, so I will probably just quickly go through what is a Spark on Kubernetes, all right? So, uh, on the left hand side, we have a Kubernetes control plan. And I'm a data person, so I don't really know much about Kubernetes internal, so we'll keep it quick and simple. So inside the control plan, we have scheduler and API server. Then when we, when user request the Spark job, uh, submit the job, right? The control plan will schedule the driver part in the data plan. And uh, inside the driver pod, we have those components. Then the driver pod will send the request back to the uh, scheduler saying it's time to schedule some executor pod. So this is what happened. We scheduled uh, three nodes uh, in this case. Then we scheduled multiple uh, amount of uh, Spark executors on each nodes. Then finally, we send the executor pod watch events from the API server to the executor pod. So this is the common workflow for Spark on Kubernetes. Let's talk about DIA challenges with the Spark on Kubernetes. So what's this fuss about, right? Um, so since the Spark 3.0, we have the lightweight of solution to support dynamic allocation uh, without external shuffle service, right? So that means you can scale 
the number of executors up and down based on your workloads. And if your executor idle, it can be removed from your Kubernetes cluster. If the pending task exists, and it will scale up, uh, request more uh, Spark executors. Can we see the problem here? So actually, Spark on Kubernetes doesn't fully support um, the exter external shuffle service. Um, even though ESS, so external shuffle service, is natively supported by Spark on Young, but it doesn't fully support in the Kubernetes pattern. So the lightweight solution I mentioned earlier is the shuffle tracking, the last one. Shuffle tracking must turn on when you need to enable the dynamic resource allocation with a Spark on Kubernetes. What happens if we don't turn on? So that's the error message you will see in your Spark application immediately. It's a little bit misleading, as you say, the Spark context error cannot initialize the driver program uh, because you have to turn on the external shuffle service. But like I said, we don't natively support external shuffle service. So what can we do? Just turn on the shuffle tracking, right? So, uh, if not, okay. So let's deep dive uh, into the challenge when we do DRA with a shuffle tracking. So what's the problem here with this lightweight solution? All right. So the dashed line means with a shuffle tracking, right? and the blue line actually represent the actual usage of your compute and memory resources. So we can see there's a lot of resource wastage here. Right? The gap highlighted in red. So our customers have to pay for those idle time. Let's dive into some example. Uh, when we turn on the shuffle tracking, uh, which actually stops our Spark cluster scale down. So the scenario here is DRA setting, uh, we can uh, scale, uh, scale up and down from one to 100 executor pod. And the executor idle timeout threshold by default is 60 seconds. I will go more in e details into that, what's that mean, okay? So let's take a look at the right hand side. So when we have a pending tasks from the Spark, it requests to scale up three nodes, just for the simplicity, okay? Scale up three nodes, EC2 nodes, all right? What gotta happen? So the pending task will run three executors, uh, one executor per EC2 node, just for the simplicity. So what happened when the pending task is finished, so no more pending task from our workload, right? And we have a two executors are idle over 60 seconds. What gotta happen? So those executors are supposed to be removed, right? And released because they, they idle, being, being idle for a long time. It's a time to, to uh, release the resources. But it's not that simple. Spark will check has it some shuffle data on the executors, right? If the answer is yes, in the node two, there's one executor being idle more than 60 seconds, but it contains a shuffle data, what gonna happen? We gotta stay, keep the node two, right? If there's a no shuffle data, we gotta terminate those executors and we can terminate the node three. Great, we save some money on running one node two EC2 instance. However, the problem is the node two. We cannot uh, scale down. So that is a DRA with uh, uh, tracking, right? Shuffle tracking. What's the second challenge? So we tried to make the shuffle tracking timeout faster, right? Maybe you remember the default setting is 60 seconds. What if we shorten the shuffle tracking time from 60 seconds to five seconds? So that configuration setting 
Spark dynamic allocation shuffle tracking timeout equals five seconds. This what happened? Fantastic. We don't really waste any resources here because we can up and down very close to the actual usage. What's the problem here? This is the problem from my testing. So uh, when you look at that red long bar, it says the stage failed. The reason is on the bottom here, it says fetch failed, means it couldn't fetch the shuffle data. Why is that? Right? Because we time out the executor too fast, every five seconds. Right? We kill, try to kill the executor. So it can't find the uh, shuffle data because it's being removed. So we lost the shuffle data during this frequent timeout operation and the stage of the Spark processing failed. So it will trigger the recomputation and your job will run uh, slower, right? So the third challenge is when we do the shuffle migration, what's that mean? So uh, since the Spark 3.0, uh, we also provide some graceful decommission feature. It's called, uh, yeah, with those are three key configurations. So when you need to do the graceful decommission, you need to turn those on, right? What happened? So your migration triggers extra cost, such as storage compute network, uh, because before you turn down or scale down one of the EC2 instance, you have to move those shuffle data from the uh, EC2 to be taken away to another healthy EC2 instance or compute node, right? That takes time when you copy. So that triggers extra cost. The second one is uh, imagine in the spot instance scenario, we have a two minutes notification so before uh, we take in the, interrupt, uh, the, the spot instances, we notify our customers in two minutes advance, right? We say we need this compute instance. So it's time for you to move all the data out of this uh, EC2, right? So the problem is the migration doesn't know the two minutes threshold. So if you are facing large amount of a shuffle data move from A to B, within that two minutes time frame, if you didn't finish copy the data, what could happen? You lose partial data. So the recomputation still happen. The third um, bullet point here is actually a quite extreme scenario, but we do have customers see this uh, problem. So sometimes when you move the shuffle data from uh, node A to node B, then the node B is about to interrupt it as well, unfortunately. So you have to continuously move from node B to node C, from node C to node D. So your decommission process actually is dramatically delayed. Okay, so to solve those challenges, we actually found a solution I'm pretty sure in the open source community, there's lots of solutions, right? So recently we actually did testing against the Apache Calibon project, and we found it is quite compelling in terms of the result. Um, so inside the uh, AWS, this is the architecture we designed and how to host this uh, remote shuffle service. There are two options here, right? The first one on the left hand side is uh, uh, hosting the Calibon cluster outside of your EMI environment. So it's completely standalone. It can serve to any other workloads, not only just the big data or Spark uh, workloads. On the right hand side, it's quite interesting. We are hosting the Calibon cluster, uh, cluster inside the EMI cluster. So the key difference between these two is the HDFS storage. That's the, only, that's the only difference. So when we host the Calibon cluster inside Yammer, 
they actually share the storage with the Spark uh, executors. Right. So in, in my benchmarking result, actually I use the left-hand side one. So I host my Calibon cluster uh, alone inside the Kubernetes environment, and my EMR can be run in any environment. Could be in um, uh, EMR serverless or EMR on Kubernetes environment, anywhere, as long as they can talk to each other. Hey. So this is my um, setup. So I turn on my Spark on Kubernetes DRA, dynamic allocation, with Apache Calibon, which means I send all of my shuffle data out out of my Spark cluster, across the network, to a standalone Apache Spark, uh, sorry, Apache Calibon. So we can see, even though it's not that curved lines in red, very close to the actual usage, right? It's the dashed line still very close to the actual uh, resource usage. So this is the great result we can achieve using Apache Calibon. So can anyone guess? I did a side-by-side -side test. One has a Calibon, one doesn't have a Calibon. Which one has DRA with Calibon? Can anyone give me the answer? No? No? Okay. I will give you the answer. So on the left-hand side is the usual shuffle tracking with a slow executor release. And on the right-hand side, we have a more responsive up and down release the executors, right? Sorry, the each blue boxes represent a Spark executor. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you can see those highlighted two to three minutes uh, time period actually has some red boxes that represent the executor being uh, killed by the driver because it's being idle. But this one, because it's been tracking it never shut down the executor, even though the executor is uh, idle. Okay, this is our favorite part. What's the result to our customers? How much do they need to spend when they enable the Calibon with the DRA? So I have two tables. Uh, the top one is using our AWS uh, Apache EMR uh, sorry, Amazon EMR with a Spark. The bottom one is the open source Spark running on Kubernetes. So we can see uh, when we run the jobs in parallel, that's a DIA with a tracking, the first one, uh, cost around $2.32 uh, US dollars. And the second run is EMR with a Calibon without tracking, without shuffle tracking. Right, it only cost $1.43. Why? Because we can release the EC2 nodes more responsively and quicker. So it actually provides uh, up to 38% of cost efficiency when we, are enable, uh, when we enable the DRA with RSS Calibon. So on the bottom is the open source Spark on Kubernetes test. Uh, yeah, the baseline is already over $5 anyway. Yeah, but you still can see when we enable the Calibon without shuffle tracking, it's also around 30% of cheaper uh, cost. So on the right hand side, that is the setting we use. And we can see that executor idle timeout is around 10, 10 seconds. So that is the sweet po uh, spot we used. We don't really define the really quick timeout but it's a, at a certain degree we time out. All right, so that's all from me, from the user perspective to use uh, Apache Calibon. So I'm going to um, invite my co-presenter, Zhou Keyong, um, to deep dive into Spark features with uh, Apache Calibon. Uh,大家好,我是周克勇,来自阿里云,啊,我接下来将会用中文跟大家分享阿帕奇克勒本内部的一些,啊,设计的一些细节,并且解释说为什么,啊,通过阿帕奇克勒本能够让斯巴克
。OK， 我们先看一下传统的 Spark 的 Shuffle 它的流程以及它存在的挑战。啊，当然这里的 Spark Shuffle 就对应于前面 Melody 呃讲到的 External Shuffle Service， 也就是 ESS。那我们知道，在大数据计算的场景 ，Shuffle 是非常呃重要的一个。呃，算子，并且它消耗了非常多的计算资源啊，有很多资料可以看到说，呃，它所消耗的整体的资源是超过百分之十五的。那同时的话，它本身并不是非常的高效，也不是很稳定。因为如果啊、呃，就是如果我们经常对 Spark 作业比较熟悉的话，会经常看到一些大的 Shuffle 的 Spark 作业，它的呃 Shuffle Fetch Time、Wait Time 会非常长。<咳>并且在 shuffle read 的阶段会经常出现啊 fetch failure 或者 out of memory 的错误。那为什么会产生这些问题呢？我们看右边这张图就是传统的 shuffle 的它的流程。啊，左边的 mapper 是产生 shuffle 数据的上游的 task， 右边的 reducer 是消费呃上游的 shuffle data 的 task。那在 mapper task， 他们会把他们产生的 shuffle 数据。啊，首先根据 partition ID 在本地做排序啊，这里的每个 partition ID 就对应于下游的每个 reducer， 呃呃，他们把排好序的 shuffle 数据写本地文件啊，同时的话还会有一个索引文件来定位每个 partition 数据的起始位置和长度。其实，在这个过程中可以看到说，假设呃某一个 shuffle task 的它所产生的 shuffle 数据比较大的话。那它做全量的排序是有可能，呃，内存不够用，呃，从而引入对外排序，进一步导致呃更多的磁盘的 I/O。OK， 然后在 shuffle read 的阶段，可以看到说，所有呃每一个 reducer 会从所有的 mapper 的 shuffle 文件中读取属于自己的 shuffle 数据。那你如果从单个 shuffle 文件的角度来看的话，会看到说一个文件会被下游的所有的呃 reduce task 来读，这个并发通常会是几千的这个量级。那同时的话，每一个请求只读取比较小的一部分数据，这个时候就会带来比较严重的随机 I/O 的一个问题。那 OK， 哦，从这个流程中还可以看到说，因为 shuffle 数据是存储在本地盘。所以说，呃，这个架构就很难做到，呃，存储计算分离。OK， 那以上的话就是，呃 ，Spark 典型的 Shuffle 的流程以及它存在的一些问题。这一页的话就是介绍说 ，Spark 是怎么样在动态资源伸缩的场景去啊、呃、去呃释放 extern 呃释放 executor 之后，同时还能。不导不不不让 shuffle 数据丢失啊！其实前面 Melody 也提到了一些，嗯 ，Spark 在 on y o u n g 的场景和 on Kubernetes 的场景其实采用的方案是不一样的。on y o u n g 的话，它是呃通过 y o u n g 的呃，就是我们知道在 y o u n g 的部署里面，每一个 y o u n g 所管理的节点都会有一个常驻的服务叫 Node Manager。那 Spark 在 Node Manager 里面实现了一个插件，就是。External Shuffle Service， 那 ESS 也是一个常驻的服务。那么 Executor 它把它呃生成的 Shuffle 文件会交给 ESS 去托去管理。在这之后，呃 ，idle 的 Executor 被释放之后，它下游的 task 可以通过 ESS 去读取上游的 Shuffle 数据，因此呢，它不会导致啊、呃、数据的丢失。所以说，呃 ，on y o u n g 的环境 ，external shuffle service 能够比较好的处理呃动态资源伸缩的一个呃一个场景。呃，当然了，它还是存在我上一页讲到的呃性能稳定性和存算耦合的一个问题。但是不幸的是，在 Kubernetes 的场景，呃，官方的 Spark 是没有一个呃 external shuffle、呃、external shuffle service。来，呃，有这么一个角色来来来用类似的方法来解决呃动态资源伸缩问题的，所以说它只能通过啊、呃、前面 Melody 讲到的啊、呃、Shuffle Tracking 或者 Grace Graceful Decommission 
啊这两种方法来 work around， 但是像前面提到的这两种方法都是存在啊呃 efficiency 的问题。当然，我们也了解到说啊有一些用户他们会在 Kubernetes 的场景啊用 demo set 的方式去启动 external shuffle service。呃，这种方式的话，呃，它能部分的解决问题，但是它对呃整个基础设施其实是有要求的，并且这种方案的话，可能呃，比如说它会要求是固定的 IP， 呃，以及呃你需要呃 S 呃 ESS 的这些节点是比较稳定的啊、呃，因为它如果被抢占的话，啊、呃，那么还是可能导致数据丢失的问题。所以我们这时候就会有一个问题，就是啊、呃，有没有一个统一的方案能够同时解决样的场景和 Kubernetes 的场景的啊、呃、动态资源伸缩的问题，以及它相比于 ESS 有更好的性能和稳定性呢？啊、呃，答案是 yes 啊、呃，就是 c o l o r b o n 其实它的定位啊、呃、就是一个统一的 Shuffle 服务啊、呃，它通过接管大数据计算引擎所产生的 Shuffle 数据，呃、来使得 s q u t e r 本身。呃，本地不需要存储 s h 数据，也就是变成无状态。这样的话，当呃 Spark 决定去 release idle 的 executor 的时候，就呃没有什么顾虑啊、呃，因为它不会导致数据的丢失。OK， 那从这张图上可以看到说，好像 c o l o r b o n 就是一个独立部署的 ESS 啊、呃，但是其实它不只是这些。呃，它相比于 ESSS 的话，呃，有更好的性能和稳定性。啊，我接下来就是介绍一下，它跟 ESS 有什么关键的不一样的地方。首先呢，呃，这里是 c o l o r b o n 的重要的组件，有三个组件 ，Master 和 Worker 组成了服务端，啊 ，Client 是集成在呃 Spark 的呃呃计算引擎里面，呃 ，Client 的话也分为两个角色。一个是运行在 driver 里面的 lifecycle manager， 他负责呃当前的 application 的 shuffle 的生命周期管理。另外一个角色的话是在每一个 executor 内部，呃，他负责呃做具体的 shuffle 数据的推送和读取。在服务端的话，呃，为了保证服务的高可用，我们对啊 master 做了一个啊 ha 啊就呃。High availability， 呃，它是基基于 r a p t 的协议去做了呃多 master 之间的状态同步。OK， 那 master 这个角色，它其实主要负责管理整个 c o l o r b o n 集群的状态，以及做负载的分配。啊 ，worker 这个角色，它主要负责存储和服务 s h a r e 数据。那我们可以看到说，呃，在 master 和 worker 之间会有一些连线。呃，呃呃，这个 dash 的 line 代表的是，呃，呃 ，control message， 呃，啊，应该说，呃，这这个没有区分，就 anyway， 呃，在 master 和 worker 之间的话，他们之间互相会有通信，呃 ，life cycle 和 master 之间也会有通信，那 executor 和 worker 之间也会有通信。OK， 那我接下来就就介绍一下说，呃，在整。以呃整个 Shuffle 它在应用了 c a l i b o n 之后的整个的流程是什么样子的？首先，当 Executor 要开始写 Shuffle 数据的时候，啊，它会它会去向 Lifecycle Manager 发起一个事件说，啊，我需要 Register Shuffle。那这时候 Lifecycle Manager 会去向呃 Master 去申请一部分的 Worker 来服务当前的这个 Shuffle。而 master 会根据当前整个集群的状态，呃，并根据一定的算法去选择一部分 worker 列表，并且返回给 lifecycle manager。然后 lifecycle manager 会把这些 worker 广播给每个 executor。这样的话，每个 executor 就会知道说，我这个 shuffle 的数据需要推给哪个 worker。然后他就开始正常的做数据的推送。当上游的 task 都执行结束之后，呃 ，lifecycle manager 会给所有参与本次 shuffle 的 worker 发一个 commit file 的一个事件
啊，让他们去把沙漠数据做一个本地的持久化。呃，在此之后，呃，下游的 stage， 也就是 reduce task 就可以启动，啊，并且通过每个 worker 上的这个 fetch server 去读取属于自己的数据。OK， 其实从这个架构上可以看到说，呃，首先。c a l a b o n 采用的是一种 push 的 shuffle， 啊 ，OK， 呃，但其实 c a l a b o n 相比于 external shuffle service， 除了 push， 它还有两个非常关键的不同点，一个叫呃 partition 数据的合并，另外一个叫 partition 文件的切分 ，OK， 呃，具体来讲就是说，左边这张图展示了 push style 和 partition 数据聚合。这两个核心设计，可以看到说，每一个 mapper， 呃，它属于同一个属于同一个 partition 的数据会推给同一个 worker， 啊，就比如说，它属于 partition 一这个数据存在 worker 一上，那么 mapper 一和 mapper 二，它它产生的属于 partition 一的 shuffle 数据都会推给 worker 一，那呃 worker 一会收到。啊、呃，这些推送来的数据之后，在内存做完做了一定的缓存之后，会生成会在本地写一个完整的文件。那在 shuffle read 阶段，每个 reducer 就会从对应的 worker 中读取一个完整的 partition 的数据。如果我们关注呃 shuffle read 阶段的话，我们可以看到说，呃，首先的话，这个网络连接数从原来的呃 all to all 的。方式变成了 one to one 的方式，啊，第二种呢，第二的话可以看到说，呃，一个文件就是正常来讲，一个 partition 的文件会是比较大的 size， 比如说二百五十六兆，那这么大的一个文件会被顺序的读取，这样的话就从啊前面讲到的这种随机的 I/O 变成了顺序的 I/O， 啊，第二的话可以看到说，因为 m a p l e 会把 shuffle 数据直接推给 c l u m cluster， 所以它本地是不需要磁盘存储沙布数据的，那么它就更有利于呃应用呃存算分离的架构。OK， 呃，右边这张图介绍的是说，呃，在一些场景下，比如说存在了 partition 的数据倾斜，或者说单纯的就是我的 shuffle size 特别的大，呃，我某一个 partition 的文件特别大，它有可能会导致磁盘不够用，啊、呃，或者说会导致。呃，单个 worker 呃长尾，那 c o l o r b o n 提供了一个机制，就叫 split， 它会监控 partition 文件的 size， 啊，如果超过了呃一 G 的默认阈值的话，会进行切分，切分之后，它属于同一个 partition 的后续的数据会被推送到新的 split 上，那这些信息的话都被完整的记录在呃 Lifecycle Manager 里面 ，reducer。会去从啊、呃、两个 split 中去读取 s h a v e 数据。OK， 那以上的话就是介绍了啊、呃、Calibon 它的核心架构。那接下来的话会去介绍一些 evaluation。这一页的 evaluation 是我们测试的呃一 T、两 T 和三 T 的纯 s h a v e 的数据，在蓝色的 E S S 上面的所。呃，所需要的时间以及啊、呃，在零点二版本和零点三版本的 c o l o r b o n 上做的呃所需要的时间，可以看到说，呃，就首先在大的 shuffle， 因为这个都是比较大的 shuffle size， 在大的 shuffle 场景下 c o l o r b o n 相比于 ESS 还是有比较明显的性能提升啊、呃，并且 shuffle 的 size 越大，它的提升越明显。下面这张表展示的是说，我因为我们知道 shuffle 的总时间它是。呃，可以分解为 shuffle write 的时间和 shuffle read 的时间。呃，这张表里面，呃，前面的这个时间是总的时间，然后括号里面第一个数字表示的是 shuffle write 的时间，第二个是 shuffle read 的时间。呃、可以看到说，呃 c a l i b o n 的架构里面，它的 shuffle write， 呃，其实是没有特别明显的优势的。从前面的介绍中也知道说，呃，其实它主要解决的是 shuffle read 阶段的稳定性和性能的问题。那从这个拆解的数字也可以看到，在 shuffle read 的这个阶段，它的时间是有非常显著的下降的。OK， 那下面这张截图的话是呃体现了应用了 c a l i b o n 之后 ，Spark 的稳定性呃会有非常大的提升
，像这个是就是其中一个用户他的生产作业，我们可以看到说，他单个 shuffle 的 size 超过了四百 TB， 这个还是非常夸张的一个数字，并且他呃他的 task 的并发也非常的夸张 ，shuffle write 一共有三十八万个 task。Shuffle read 有十二万个 task， 但是在这整个过程中，我们可以看到没有任何的 fail 的 task， 啊，所以它能很好的体现出 c o l o b o n 在非常大的 shuffle 作业的情况下对性能和稳定性的提升。OK， 那我们还做了还在标准的 TBCDS 啊十 T 的 scale 上做了测试，呃，测试的结论是说，呃，因为 c o l o b o n 它同时支持了。呃，两副本，那在单副本的情况下，相比 ESS 有百分之二十的性能提升，呃，两副本的话是有百分之十五左右。OK， 那 c a l i b o n 我们前前面提到说，它主要是在 Shuffle 的场景能够很好的提升 Spark 或 Spark on Kubernetes 的性能和稳定性。那它仅仅是一个 shuffle service 吗？或者说它仅仅是呃 for Spark 吗？其实也不是这样的啊。那呃 c l u b o n 的话，我们是将来是希望说它同时还能接管 spill 的数据和缓存的数据。呃，这样的话 ，big data 的呃计算引擎它产生的各种中间数据都可以交给 c l u b o n 去啊、呃、接管，那么它就真正的可以摆脱对本地盘的依赖。呃，后面的呃，其他的话，我们还会想，还会做一些，比如说分层的存储啊、呃，我们希望用内存做小 shuffle 的加速，呃，以及我们希望用对象存储来，来呃，来降低 c o l o b o n 集群对本地磁盘的依赖啊、呃。再比如，呃，来自 l i n k i n 的团队，其实在给社区贡献认证和安全隔离的 feature。呃，同时的话，我们未来还计划说。会支持更多的呃计算引擎 ，OK， 好，呃，那最后的话就是有一些联系方式，我们也希望感兴趣的啊、呃、朋友可以加入我们，谢谢。哎，没问题，站站。嗯、um, ，OK， 呃、uh, ，Is there any questions? I think it's a Q&R time. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. Sorry, it's going to be in English. I apologize. Um, when it comes to your node sizes, when you're actually running the executors, um, if the shuffle files can fit on the executors, is it sometimes like not advantageous to do a backup? So like um, you write to the executors and then at the same time send out to um, Celeborn. Like, because if you wait on Celeborn every time, that network time might be longer than just writing to the disk on the executor itself. So you're doing an, a, um, like a backup at the same time allows for you to actually continue with the task and not block on writing. So, yeah. No, 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 I'm wondering if that's like a use case, because I think the exact example was you directly write to Celeborn. Yeah, Celebor we directly send all the shuffle data out of your Spark cluster to Calibon over the network. So uh, are you asking, do we have any cache uh, mechanism before sending over to the Calibon? Is that your question? Yeah, like if the data is small and yeah. it could fit on the node, right, okay. you could just write it locally okay. to the executor and then. OK, um, if I understand correctly, your question is that uh, can we use Calibon as a backup? So sometimes, for example, for small shuffle jobs, we can use the traditional or a uh, uh, typical uh, shuffle. And for a, a very big shuffle, we can use Calibon. And the answer is yes, uh, because um, currently Calibon shuffle has a plugin mechanism so that you can customize uh, if one shuffle can go, you know, local shuffle and another shuffle can go to Calibon based on multiple policies, for example, the shuffle size, or for example, the uh, status of the Calibon cluster, and all that you have a configuration that you uh, force, force the shuffle to use the uh, traditional shuffle mechanism. 
And if you have heterogeneous hardware, is it going to be aware of the actual node size too, of how much ephemeral storage is on the pod? Does it know that? Or is the setting just like if shuffle larger than two gigabytes, then local? Um, are you referring to the Spark port, executor port, or Calibon port? So if the shuffle is bigger than two gigabytes, you send yes. to Calibon. But if your pod has ephemeral storage of 300 gigabytes, you're like, oh, I can fit 300 gigabytes, right? So is it? Uh, OK. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, for now, um, Calibon does not support you know, dynamic switch between the local shuffle and Calibon. Uh, that is to say, for example, if, we, if you decided that uh, one shuffle IP uses Calibon, then you can, you can um, switch uh, uh, some tasks of the stage to use Calibon and, or, and other tasks to use the local disk. It doesn't support this. Uh, it only supports, uh, you know, uh, um, either the the whole shuffle uh, to for for one shuffle ID, either the shuffle all tasks in the shuffle stage uh, uses Calibon, or uh, all tasks of the shuffle uses the local disk. It can switch between uh, you know traditional shuffle and Calibon within one shuffle. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I, all, uh, if I understand correctly, you may refer to that you can based on the size of the port storage to decide whether we need, we should go to Calibon or to, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, my opinion is that um, it can be, a, it is an, it, it can be a policy to, you know, um, uh, to, it can be a policy, you can implement such a policy so that it can, it can do this, uh, but uh, I'm not sure whether it's a you know generally good policy, uh, because uh, for example, if the task, uh, the number of tasks is really large, for example, more than ten thousand, uh, even though your SQL port has enough uh, disk storage to hold the shuffle data, it may be not efficient uh, because of the Random IO, yeah. So I think it depends, yeah. Yeah, so I just uh, add a little bit to that explanation. Uh, Apache Calibon is not a solution fit for all, right? So we need to choose, make decision. What kind of use case do you have? If, you, if your entire Spark job only contains gigabytes of a shuffle data at each stage, right? You don't need a remote shuffle service. You can just use the default shuffle tracking. That's fine. This is for uh, extremely large scale uh, workloads that, that you will benefit the most. Right? So we have that example. We have a customer have um, uh, hundreds of terabytes of data shuffling in one single stage. That's when you need to enable the, the Apache Calibon remote shuffle service for that particular job. Right? So usually, if your Spark job is okay, just don't need to have a large scale of a shuffling, you don't need to turn on Apache's Calibon. Uh, no, no, the reason I was asking is because you can have both, right? So if you yeah. allow for a backup to happen at the same time concurrently, like, like a concurrent backup, when you do your fetches, mm. right, your shuffle fetches, you can either read from the executor or you can read from the Celebrant cluster, the RSS yeah. registry, right? And so. Based on that, if the, if the executor goes down, you can always read, but you have both in terms of speed if you don't want to have the right so, take so too you, long. So you mean that, uh, for example, in the shuffle write uh, phase, uh, the map task will write the shuffle data both locally and push to the Calibon. Yeah, this is uh, how uh, uh, Apache Spark does. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I know that that method is uh, contributed by um, people from LinkedIn, and the project is called Magnet. And yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I uh, I think it's uh, it's a good solution uh, for uh, if the yeah. Um, 
if the external, sh oh, okay. With, a, with external shop service, uh, I think it's a good solution. And uh, uh, for Calibon, I, I also think it, it can do this. Yeah, I think it can do, we can have a try. Maybe you can contribute to the community to bring in this uh, extra fantastic feature as well to spin up, yeah, speed up the entire performance. Like it's like HDFS writes are very slow, yeah. so sometimes it's like. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions in the in the audience? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Th th thanks for your great talk. I have two questions. Uh, first is uh, uh, about the cost down numbers. Uh, does it uh, also include the cost on the Calibon cluster? Uh, uh, which cost? Is it this one, uh, the batch benchmarking? Uh, in, in your uh, okay. talk. The, this one? Uh, yes. Yep. So, uh, which cost are you referring uh, up to? Up to the 38% cheaper when oh, using. Okay. Yeah, so the 38% cheaper is comparing, purely comparing this result. So this cost. And this cost contains everything. So including Yema uplift premium price mm -hmm. plus EKS compute EC2 instances price mm -hmm. plus storage. Uh, so uh, plus the Calibon storage cost? Uh, very good question. Actually, it didn't include Calibon because all of okay. these have a Calibon cost behind the scene, right? So I assume the cost should be highly similar. Uh, but that's a very good point. We should add a Calibon cost in it. But I'm very confident that shouldn't make a big difference. The okay, main thank you. big difference is the dynamic allocation resource up and down, right? When you release an EC2 node, that will save you a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and my second question is, uh, uh, I, I see in your slides that Calibon runs on uh, directly on EC2 nodes. Does it support uh, to run on Kubernetes cluster? Uh, actually, it is running on the Kubernetes environment. Uh, okay. Probably this, uh, yeah, this uh, diagram wasn't uh, that clear. Uh, actually, this is uh, in, inside the Kubernetes. Sorry, this okay. should be EKS. This is in the Yama, either on EC2 or serverless. Also, uh, also does Calibon support like auto scale for the workers? Correct. Yeah. Okay, uh, I will uh, complement some. Uh, okay, for the first question, we have some users that exactly uses the uh, Spark on Kubernetes with Calibon cluster. And, the, and in there, they told me that the overall cost has decreased uh, remarkably because of the uh, better elasti elasticity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the Calibon cluster usually do not require much resource. Uh, it, it, it do requires, uh, uh, you can think of that like, um, for traditional shuffle, your your computer node, your pod has storage and uh, uh, and uh, uh, network resources for the shuffle. And with Calibon, you just offload the storage to the Calibon cluster uh, and the network resource. So uh, it 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 does not uh, add uh, much more resources and. At the, same time, at the same time, because it is more uh, efficient and more I.O. friendly, it, it indeed uh, reduces the resources for storing and network. That's for the first question. And for the second question, uh, yes, Calibon supports um, to be deployed uh, on the Kubernetes, and uh, uh, it supports dynamic elasticity, uh, uh, even though it is not very uh, complete for now, but it, it supports, uh, you can decommission a Calibon worker and it will, you know, release the, it will release uh, when it does, it, it finishes serving the local shuffle data. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I, I like today's talk, thanks.
Thank you. Um, any more questions? I understand it's already lunchtime. I really appreciate everyone has the passion here, stay with us, have all the questions. Yeah, please go ahead. So, yeah, thanks. Um, I have a very quick question. I know it's probably a little bit off topic because um, my company uses both uh, Kubernetes as well as Databricks to run Spark. I just wonder if there's any chance from upstream perspective uh, the Carbon can be enabled uh, from the SaaS provider such as Databricks. Because we like the simplicity of having SaaS rather than running everything from scratch if it's available. Um, may I ask a little bit question? So where is your Databricks hosted? So our Databricks hosted on Azure. In Azure, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so that means, uh, so Databricks, uh, at this stage, Databricks doesn't support containerization. Yeah, we know that, right? So your Databricks clusters has to run on the EC2 equivalent compute node. Yep. So if you want to use Calibon self-hosted, you could run the cluster of Calibon uh, either on the compute node, similar to your Databricks compute node, the elasticity, like up and down uh, scale, probably is not that good because it's fixed size of EC2 instances. Mm. Uh, however, if you run Calibon cluster in the Kubernetes environment, such as, uh, I don't know, in Azure, is it called AKS? AKS. Yes. So if you host that in AKS, uh, it, it should enable you to use Calibon. But yeah. the downside is you need to enable the network, right? Yeah. So your Databricks on, e on the compute needs to be able to talk to your Kubernetes in AKS. Okay. Because you imagine you will have large amount of data sets sending over from Databricks cluster into Kubernetes environment and also lots of a read happening. Yeah. So the performance could be the bottleneck. So you have to fu fully test it. Is it worth it? Or is not. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. I, I have some compliment. Uh, uh, if you uh, uh, I don't know if you are asking whether we need to modify Spark to Spark. It's not. And I think it's all the schedule of things of Databricks is probably managed by Databricks itself. So yeah, I kind of I kind of had an answer myself that if it's not supported. That's end of the story, unless you wanted to build everything in Kubernetes or AKS yourself. Right? But I just wonder from upstream perspective okay. if there's any plans in the future that can be enabled. Because I'm interested in reducing any potential cost that I can, um, you know, to bring it down. Yeah. So actually, uh, I from AWS. So actually, we are introduced this with uh, EMR on AKS. Okay. So our EMR, sorry, our EMR product actually do offer. Uh, this solution in our Yama on EKS feature. Yeah, yeah just okay. to let you know. Yeah.